The Lioness Trilogy is a group of three fantasy novels by Jack Vance, set in the European Dark Ages, in the mythical Elder Isles west of France and southwest of Britain, a generation or two before the birth of King Arthur. An Atlantis theme haunts the story, as do numerous references to Arthurian mythology. Some place names and concepts, such as references to sandestins as magical creatures that do the actual work of carrying out a magician's spells, are shared between Lioness and Vance's Dying Earth series, suggesting that the two worlds may be linked. Vance makes no pretense of historical accuracy. The society depicted is in general of the later Middle Ages, with trading cogs plying the seas, knights engaged in jousting and following the fully developed code of chivalry, and royal courts dancing the pavane and cotillon, all of which would be gross anachronisms when assumed to take place in the 5th century. In this Vance, in fact, followed the conventions of the original Arthurian tales, which depicted the society of their own time rather than that of the historical King Arthur. Books The three volumes were published in order of their fictional chronology, Lioness 1983 subtitled Book 1, Soldrun's Garden on the title page. The Green Pearl 1985 Maduke 1989 Topic. Plot Summary Topic. Lioness also known as Soldrun's Garden The story is told in several interlocking threads which are not always chronological. King Casimir of Lioness arranges the marriage of his daughter Soldrun to Fod Carfilhiot, Duke of Vale Evander. In this Casimir hopes to bring armies through Carfiliot's lands in South Ulfland, so as to attack the rival kingdom Dahout on two fronts. Repelled by Carfilhiot, Soldrun refuses. In a rage, Casimir confines her to her garden, barred on two sides by a steep ravine, the third by a wall and a locked gate, and the fourth by the sea. Soldrun is content to be alone until one day a half-drowned sailor washes ashore. Princes Aelas and Trewan of Troisonet are sent on a sea voyage to visit the various kingdoms of the Elder Isles to gain experience at statecraft. While in port, Trewan learns that his father has died and that the line of royal succession now passes from King Granis to his youngest brother Ospero and then to Ospero's son Aelas, bypassing Trewan. He conceals this knowledge from Aelas and, late at night, pushes Aelas overboard. Aelas washes ashore at the foot of Soldrun's garden. While he recovers, they become lovers and plan to escape. However, they are caught and betrayed by the Queen's confessor brother Umfred and Casimir orders Aelas imprisoned without even bothering to learn his name. In due time, Soldrun delivers a son named Dhrun, and gives him into the care of her former nurse to hide him from her father. However, Dhrun is taken by the fairies and replaced with the changeling Maduk. Casimir retrieves the baby and, none the wiser, takes her back to the castle. Believing that Aelas and her son are dead, Soldrun hangs herself in her garden. Aelas manages to escape and returns to the garden where he learns from Soldrun's ghost that he has a son, but he is perplexed to see the Princess Maduke in a royal procession. Aelas learns of the changeling from the old nurse and sets out on a quest to find his son, using a never-fail 
a talisman that points him in the right direction, obtained from the fairies at no small price. Dhrun, a cheerful happy baby, is raised in Thripsi Shi by Twisk, Madusi's mother, who stole him from the old nurse's family, leaving Maduk, her willful and cranky child by an unknown vagabond. Time passes differently in the Shi than in the mortal realm. Dhrun lives nine years in the Shi in the span of one mortal year. Since he is not a true fairy, he is cast out of the she, but without malice, except for a spiteful rival who curses him with seven years of bad luck. Dhrun sets out through the forest of Tantravals, a haunted place where the human presence is weak and the supernatural is very real. He rescues Glynneth, a girl of about fourteen, from a troll, and they have a number of adventures before joining Dr. Fidelius, supposedly a physician specializing in the treatment of sore knees, who travels between the country fairs of Dahout in a medicine show wagon pulled by two two-headed horses. Fod Karfilhiat, wanting to be a powerful magician but lacking the patience to learn the necessary skills, schemes with his lover Tamarello. They will use Melinth to seduce and distract Shimrod while Karfilhiat steals his magical apparatus, by which theft Shimrod, relatively new to his craft, would be so weakened as a magician that he could not retaliate. The plot is successful but Shimrod's equipment is protected by magical locks and is unusable. Shimrod learns from a magic monitor that watches his house that the thieves who tortured his house servant and stole his goods were a handsome young aristocrat and an older robber who complained that years of climbing on rooftops had left him with sore knees. Shimrod adopts the guise of Dr. Fidelius, a specialist in sore knees, in hopes of finding the robber, who will lead him to the aristocrat. Alice's quest to find his son is interrupted when he is captured by the Ska. He tries to ransom his freedom, but they are not a numerous people and need labor more than gold. The Ska lay siege to Carfiliot's castle Tinson Firel, and Ayla's gets a good look at the castle's defences. He is then sent to work as a house slave at Castle Sank, home of the Ska Duke Luhalk X and his family, where he becomes infatuated with Lady Tatzel, the Duke's daughter. Ayla's escapes Castle Sank with two other slaves, Yane and Cargus, but they are recaptured and sent to the fortress Politets, which guards the boundary of Dahout and North Ulfland. Here, Ayla's is assigned to a work crew digging a secret tunnel from Politets out to the plain in front of the fortress. Ayla's leads another escape, and after a series of adventures finds himself on the southern outskirts of Avalon, the capital city of Dahout. The Never Fail indicates that Dhrun is northward, in the city or beyond. Fod Karfilhiat leads a band of men out from Tinson Firel on a hunting expedition to capture one of the barons who oppose his rule. However, it's an ambush, set up by Carfiliot's enemies working together. His troops are killed one by one but he escapes with his life and seeks refuge at Melanchthy's palace. He says they should be lovers, who better, since they are the same person. She disdains him because he inhaled the green fume whereas she tasted it and spat it out. He seduces her. In retaliation, she magically transports him all the way across the Elder Isles to Avalon. Lacking funds, he seeks out the bandit Rugalt of the Sore Knees, his accomplice, to provide him shelter and funds. Rugalt is practically destitute, his knees are so bad he can no longer burgle houses and his only income comes from robbing the guests of a mean little inn. 
He sees Dr. Fidelius Wagon at the Great Fair of Avalon and is desperate for a cure. Carfilhiot tells him Fidelius is probably a quack but Rugalt is adamant, if he got his agility back, he would no longer be poor. Shimrod takes Rugalt deep into the woods and extracts Carfilhiot's name from him. Carfilhiot, waiting for Rugalt, suddenly intuits that Fidelius was Shimrod. He kidnaps Dhrun and Glyneth and steals the wagon, driving it to Tamarello's mansion, who uses magic to send it back to Tinson Firel. Ailas, now in Avalon, learns from the captain of a Troyce ship that his father lies dying. If he dies and Ailas is not on hand, Trewan will be crowned king. As Ailas, Yane and Cargus debate what to do, Shimrod runs up and asks if they have seen a wagon pulled by a pair of two-headed horses. Ailas had, and Shimrod tells him that Fod Carfilhiot has kidnapped two children that were traveling with him. Ailas notices that the Never Fail is suddenly pointing south, and asks the names of the children. Shimrod and Ailas ride to Tamarello's mansion but arrive too late, Carfilhiot and the wagon are gone. Ailas decides with a heavy heart he must return to Troisonet to prevent Trewan from being crowned king. Accompanied by Yane and Cargus, Ailas arrives at the last possible minute and confronts Trewan with his murderous deed. When Trewan attacks Ailas Cargus kills him, and Ailas is crowned king of Troisonet. Shimrod cannot act directly against Carfilhiot to rescue Glynneth and Dhrun, because that would constitute taking Aelus's side in a political matter and violate Mergen's edict. However, Aelus has learned that Quill C, king of South Ulfland, has drowned in his bathtub, and that Aelus is his rightful heir by collateral lineage. He lands a force of troops in South Ulfland, proclaims his kingship, and demands a show of fealty from Carfilhiot as Carfilhiot's rightful liege lord. Carfilhiot refuses, and Aelus's Troyce troops lay siege to his castle. Aelus's soldiers, informed by his knowledge of the castle's defences, avoid the traps and pitfalls Carfilhiot has prepared, much to Carfilhiot's dismay. He calls on Tamarello, who confronts Aelus. This gives Shimrod an excuse to call on Mergen, who forbids Tamarello from acting and banishes him to his mansion. Tamarello offers to bring Carfilhiot to his manse, but Carfilhiot refuses to leave his castle. The siege is eventually successful, Dhrun and Glyneth are rescued, and Carfilhiot is hanged as a traitor to his king. When his body is cremated, a green fume escapes and blows out to sea, where it mixes with the spume and condenses into a green pearl which sinks into the sea and is swallowed by a fish. Aelas, now king of Troisonet, Deshinet and South Ulfland, and his son Dhrun, make a diplomatic visit to Lioness. Casimir is puzzled as to how Aelas, barely out of his teens, could have a nine-year-old son, and why Aelas's face seems rather familiar. Topic. The Green Pearl In a fishing village in South Ulfland, a fisherman catches a flounder and discovers the green pearl inside. The pearl changes hands a number of times, impelling each new owner to strange excesses of conduct, until the final owner offends a minor magician, who takes him deep into the forest and casts a spell of paralysis on him. His body decomposes and merges with the forest floor. In the spring, beautiful flowers with strangely evocative odors sprout at the site. 
Ailas and Dhrun divide their time between Waterschade, Ailas's placid castle on the island of Troisenet, and his new capital Dune Derrick in South Ulfland. Glynneth has been installed at court with the anomalous title, Princess, and Shimrod is a frequent guest. Ayla's journeys to South Ulfland where he attempts to convince the fiercely independent barons to accept his rule as king. He bans private justice and torture and orders the barons to forget their old feuds and unite against the Ska. Ailis's program gains credibility when he sends a force to destroy the mountain keep of the first baron to openly defy him. In Lioness, King Casimir plots to destabilize South Ulfland by sending two agents, Sir Shallus and Torkel. Casimir sends Shallus into the Ulfish uplands to sow dissent among the barons through rumor and intrigue. Torkel, a renegade Ska, is ordered to assemble a band of cutthroats to attack those nobles who support Aelus's rule. Torkel has his own plans, to conquer all of the Elder Isles for himself, and Casimir soon grows exasperated with Torkel's demands for ever-increasing amounts of gold. Casimir is also troubled by a prophecy made at Soldrun's birth that her son would rule the Elder Isles. Casimir believes Soldrun gave birth to a girl, the Princess Maduke. He applies to Tamarello for assistance, who sends to him Visbume, a low magician of peculiar personal habits. Visbume makes inquiries and informs Casimir that Soldrun's child was, in fact, a boy and that Maduke is a fairy changeling. Visbume learns that the boy, known to the fairies as Tippet, was traveling with a girl named Glynneth, and that Soldrun's former nursemaid, who had tried to hide Dhrun from Casimir, had left Lioness with her entire family and were now landed gentry on Troisenet. The next line of inquiry is obvious. In South Ulfland, Ailas ponders how to test his new army, composed of Trois knights and Trois trained Ulfish soldiers. The Ska are fearsome in battle but their weakness is their small numbers. Ailas plans a series of hit-and-run raids designed to inflict casualties while avoiding a pitched battle he would almost certainly lose. Ailas sends a force against the lightly defended Castle Sank and succeeds in destroying the garrison and the outer buildings but not the inner citadel. Watching from a distance, Ailas sees a party of Ska approaching Sank on horseback, including the Lady Tatzel. Ailas pursues and captures her, declaring she is now his slave. Since the route back to Dune Derrick was likely to be swarming with Ska troops responding to the attack on Castle Sank, Ailas decides to travel north along the high moors into North Ulfland, to arrive at Songs where he can take a ship home. Along the way they pass Torkel's fortress hideout, Torkel challenges Ailas who defeats him in a duel and leaves him for dead. Tatsil is proud and haughty, her worldview will not accept that she has been made a slave by an otherling, as the Ska refer to outsiders. However, she gradually comes to recognize Ailis's intelligence and competence. Ailis, for his part, discovers that the Tatsil of reality is nothing like the Tatsil of his daydreams, and the infatuation is broken. They eventually develop a wary mutual respect. After a series of further adventures, Ailas and Tatzel arrive at Songs, to find the dying King Gax beset by a Ska delegation headed by Tatzel's father, Duke Luhalk X. The Ska wish King Gax to appoint a Ska successor to his throne, in return for which the Ska promise amnesty for the inhabitants of Zongs. 
Gax would prefer that his successor drive the ska out, but the legal heir, Sir Crime, has already indicated to the ska that he could be bribed to abdicate, and Gax expects to die a bitter death. Ayla's returns his unsatisfactory slave to her father, and in a private audience with King Gax, reveals his identity. In a public ceremony, Gax transfers the crown to Ayla's, much to the surprise and consternation of the Ska. Glynneth, at Watershade, ponders her future. She has been playing flirtatious games with Ayla's, testing him, but decides that the time for games and testing is over. Before she can act on her decision, she is kidnapped by Visbume and taken to the alternate world tangectorly. Visbume promises to return her to Earth if she tells him the circumstances of Drun's birth, but his obvious designs on her person inform her that she will be killed once he has the information. Glynneth feigns intimacy long enough to strike Visbume with his own dagger, then runs away into the wilds of Tangectorly. Ayla's and Shimrod are prevented from following Glynneth through the portal into Tangectorly by Mergen, who understands that this is part of a plot by Kazmir and Timorello to get rid of them, thus weakening Mergen and advancing Kazmir's political goals. Mergen instead sends an agent, synthesized from the physical pattern of a fierce beast from Tangectorly and the guile and cunning of a barbarian pirate named Kul. To give Kul a human soul with love and loyalty for Glynneth, Mergen infuses it with Aelis's blood. In Tangectorly, Kul catches up with Glynneth and rescues her from Visbume. Under duress, Visbume explains that passages to Earth can only be opened at certain times and places, and the next opportunity is many leagues distant. After many adventures they arrive at the portal and Visbume opens the way, but causes the animal they have been riding to attack Kul, injuring him. Glynneth, though frightened of Kul at first, has grown to love the human spirit within him, and refuses to leave him. Glynneth tells Visbume the truth about Drun's birth, and Visbume vanishes through the gate. At the Goblin Fair in the forest of Tantravals, Melinth is entranced by four beautiful flowers she has bought, which evoke emotions she can't quite identify. Both Shimrod and Timorello arrive, prompted by the opening of the interworld portal. Timorello accosts Visbume, learns Drun's secret, and then turns Visbume into a snake so that he can not reveal the truth to anyone else. Shimrod and Melinth peruse the booths at the fair. The flower seller, in search of more, has dug up the green pearl causing the flowers to die, to Melinthi's great disappointment. He offers her the pearl, but Shimrod dissuades her. Timorello also sees it and is captivated, but before he can take it, a snake darts out from the forest and swallows it. Timorello instantly chants a spell and turns into a weasel, pursues the snake into its hole and returns triumphantly with the pearl in his teeth. Mergen, disguised as a peasant, quickly seals the weasel and pearl in a glass jar. The weasel dissolves into a green transparency, like a skeleton in aspic. With no word from Tangectorly, Ayla's resumes his campaign against the Ska. His hit-and-run strategy finally prompts a tactical mistake by the Ska, who divide their forces into two smaller armies. Aelis's ulfish army attacks and destroys one of these armies. Aelis offers a peace agreement whereby the Ska return to the original limits of their territory, in return Aelis will demand no reparations or hostages. The Ska agree. 
In Tangectorly KUL follows the orders implanted in him to return Glynith to their original starting point, which is the location of the other portal. On the way they are attacked several times so that he loses a great deal of blood, and the beast and pirate aspects of KUL begin to assert themselves. They reach the portal and are besieged by enemies, but Shimrod appears to rescue her. Glynith will not leave KUL, but Shimrod explains that while KUL is dying, his love for her came from someone else. Shimrod and Glynith return to Earth where she is reunited with Aelas, now the undisputed king of Troisenet, Dashinet and Ulfland, who reveals his deep love for her manifested through KUL and asks her to be his queen, which she gladly accepts. Aelas, Dhrun, Glynith and Shimrod journey to Watershade for a banquet, while in Lioness, Kazmir awaits news from Visbume that will never come, and ponders the mystery of Suldrun's son. <laughs> Meduk Princess Maduk, unaware of her true parentage, suffers an unhappy childhood comparable to Soldrun's, but has more spunk and actively resists the regimen imposed upon her as a royal princess. On an unauthorized outing into the forest, she is separated from her bodyguard, the stable hand Pimfet, and discovers her mother, the fairy Twisk, and learns the truth, including the fact that her father's identity is unknown. She meets Prince Dhrun at a reception and shares her knowledge with him, incidentally establishing a mutual but low-key attraction. Meanwhile, Kazmir continues to plot against Aelas by funding the exploits of the Ska renegade Torkel, which however have little effect against Aelas's precautions. Alias defeats the Ska residing in a fort on the border with Dahout and claims the fort itself by law of conquest, causing tensions between the two nations. King Audrey is distraught to find his army, though still strong, is slowly growing fat and complacent from mismanagement, and begins trying to reassert himself as a military power. Shimrod the Wizard, at Mergen's request, investigates mysterious demonic attentions in Wise, which appear to involve Melanth. Mergen is too busy watching over Wald, a trapped being of apocalyptic power, to do so himself. Melanth continues to fascinate and frustrate Shimrod, and he is unable to learn what her plans are. Later, as part of his service to Mergen, Shimrod disguises himself as a Scythian bravo to infiltrate Torkal's band. He is unable to make progress in his investigation of Melanth, but disrupts a plot to assassinate King Aelas and kidnap Dhrun. The corpses of the dead assassins are reanimated and march to Kazmir's court before expiring in order to send a message. Torkel sets off with Melanth. Maduk having angered Kazmir by refusing to be part of a marriage alliance he's devised, the king punishes her and humors Queen Solace by making Maduk the prize in a quest for the Holy Grail, a relic which would draw pilgrims to the cathedral being built under the instigation of the treacherous brother Umfred, who has revealed to Kazmir that Dhrun is Soldrun's son. Madusi's response is to seek the grail herself, since that seems the best method of preserving herself. Kazmir, distracted by other matters, accidentally gives the royal blessing to the journey. Together with Pimfet, Maduk sets off on a journey for the grail and for the identity of her father. While she fails to find out who her father truly is even with the help of the fairies and Twisk, as he used a pseudonym while courting Twisk, she does discover what seems to be the grail. 
She and Pimfet travel to the castle where the Grail is, and through cunning manage to kill the ogre troop and retrieve the Grail, a task that hundreds of knights had tried and failed. Unfortunately, Casimir reneges on his promise. Though his life is spared, Pimfet is still punished harshly despite retrieving the Grail, and Maduk begins to truly hate Casimir with all her being. Maduk then discovers Casimir's plan to frustrate the Magic Mirror's prophecy that Dhrun would rule the Elder Isles, by having him sit momentarily at the magic table in the capital city of Dahout and then having Dhrun killed. To this end, Casimir arranges for a colloquy despite having no desire for peace. On the way there, Maduk manages to earn a sliver of respect from Queen Solace when the latter learns of the deeds involved in retrieving the Grail, though the two are still on poor terms. In revenge for his treatment of Pimfet and herself, Maduk foils Casimir's plan by publicly warning Dhrun and the assembled worthies humiliating Casimir in the middle of the colloquy. She is stripped of her rank and forbidden from finishing what she had to say, but her message does not fall on deaf ears. Any doubt the worthies had in her statements evaporates when Alias, who had been running late, dramatically arrives and corroborates her story. After King Audrey and King Dartweg publicly feud over Celtic bandits, the colloquy is called off. Maduk is then kidnapped by Casimir's agents but rescued by Ailas and Dhrun. Meanwhile, Torkel and Melinth arrive at Mergen's manse. Desmai manifests out of Melinth, possesses Torkel, and the Melinth is left to be brutally killed by Mergen's sentries. Inside, Mergen himself is bound by demonic hands. Desmai orders Torkel to free the Green Pearl so she can be whole, but by accident the Ska instead releases to Morello. Desmai's physical form is destroyed, and an insane Timorello tries to free Wald with the help of Torkel simply to spite Mergen, fully aware that it will mean the end of the Elder Isles. Wald manages to partially wrench free, and his presence in the Atlantic causes a massive tsunami that wipes out Wise instantly and the majority of Vale Evander shortly after. Before they can cause the downfall of the entire island however, Timorello is defeated and Torkel is beheaded. Desmai and Timorello, unable to be destroyed by normal means since the green has rendered them partially demonic, are instead sent to an alternate dimension where one of Mergen's associates annihilates them utterly in supernatural fire. The green is revealed to be a corrupting magical force and an element of a much larger inter-dimensional war, which Mergen has been trying to keep from reaching Earth. The deed done, Mergen collapses into a chair, crestfallen. Mergen explains to Shimrod that some of the dead gods of Lioness favor Wald, that to kill him would incur their wrath, and thus all that Mergen can do is keep Wald imprisoned for as long as he lives. Casimir, emboldened by the news of the destruction of Vale Evander, throws the dice on a war against Dahout. He finds that Dahout puts up much more of a fight than expected. The ULFS counterattack by raiding the coasts of Lioness, and Gedelia enters the war on Casimir's side in response. After several battles, the Dahout army is routed. Prince Cassander is wounded trying to kill the fleeing King Audrey. Ignoring the advice of his more experienced advisors and overeager to prove himself, the wounded Cassander orders his scouts to embark on a pointless search that gives the Dahout army time to regroup and escape. Though King Audrey later puts up a valiant fight that allows the majority of his remaining army to escape across the border into the Ulflands, he and his son are killed. 
Da Hout is conquered, but this triggers an attack on Kazmir by Ayla's. Cassander is killed during a retreat shortly after, putting an undignified end to the ambitious young man. The Troy's army routs Kazmir's army, and Kazmir enters the battle only to shortly after flee back towards Lioness Town. Kazmir discovers to his dismay that Lioness Town was captured in his absence. Queen Solace, still in possession of the Grail, was exiled to Europe after the castle fell, and the reader is told she would spend the rest of her days crying over the Holy Grail and her dashed dreams of sainthood. After her death, the Grail is lost again, to be searched for later by King Arthur. After this aside, Casimir is arrested and spends the rest of his days in a cell ruminating over his defeat. Aelas declares himself king of the Elder Isles with Dhrun as his heir and brings peace to the realm, also taking the opportunity to have Umfred drowned for his betrayal of Suldrun. Glyneth, now queen, gives birth to her and Aelas's daughter, Princess Cyril. Maduke and Dhrun are in love, and when Twisk is summoned to partake in the celebrations it is finally learned that Madusi's father is actually Shimrod. All ends happily. Topic. Commentary One view is that the characterizations of the various kingdoms are decidedly Eurocentric. The Celts of Gedelia are fickle and eccentric, the ambitious and aggressive King Casimir is a Germanic despot in all but name, the court of King Audrey of Dahout is a caricature of the decadent excesses of a French monarch and the Ska are transparently cruel Viking raiders. The picture is complete with the Arthurian figure of Prince Aelas hailing from the plucky island race of Troisonet whose sea power is crucial to the story. Aelas's policies are based on the balance of power doctrine, whereby Troisonet seeks to make sure no mainland power would become too strong by supporting the weaker party in any conflict, which is clearly reminiscent of the traditional British policy with regard to Europe. Also Aelas's later policy, after having become ruler of the entire central island of Hybris, to maintain only a limited land army and rely on a strong navy for protection against outside invasion, has a distinct British flavour. Indeed, it can be argued that the entire background to the work is a reworking of the Arthurian myths, complete with a great mage Merlin, Mergen, a round table, Kerbra and Medan, chivalric codes and a search for the Holy Grail. However, unlike the awe in which the original Arthurian characters hold the Grail, Vance's attitude is quite cynical. While many objects described in the trilogy have considerable magical powers, the Grail does not seem to have such. The only use contemplated for the Grail was King Casimir's idea of increasing pilgrimage to his capital and thus the royal revenues. This did not come true, and in the end the Grail gets taken out of Lioness without having made much impression on anybody. The Arthurian hypothesis can perhaps be countered by strong indications that the author has delivered a very conscious melding of various other medieval folkloric and more formal story-telling themes, characters and plot devices. The proto-Arthurian characters are rather a pre-working of the later romance and still distinct from that tale. Similarly, the Ska, who are equated with the Nemedians of Irish mythology are repeatedly described as pre-Viking, and indeed having encountered Neanderthals, giving them a far richer presence than cruel Viking raiders. Vance builds the history of his world using layers of facts, names and religions taken from various European cultures, 
Greeks, Romans, Celts, pre-Carolingian French and Spanish, kingdoms, etc., and adding in places and peoples imagined by those same cultures, Atlantis, Wise, Avalon, Former and so on. This fantastical, factual mix is used to ground his tale in history. It also seems to give some of the same depth that a longer series of books might develop where place, relationships and plot are built up over time as in Thomas Hardy's Wessex or Trollope's Barsetshire. It seems to provide the believability that develops where a story is set in a well-known, well-defined historical setting as if the reader holds merely a hitherto untold story. The combination of a tale that is apparently set in medieval Europe, but which contains significant elements of fantasy and magic lends itself to use as setting for role-playing games such as Dungeons and Dragons. Topic. Lands doomed to sink At the very first paragraph of the first book, Vance informs the reader that the Elder Isles sank under the sea at some later time, which, indeed, readers can know for themselves by glancing at the map of Western Europe and finding no such islands off its shore. The Elder Islands are clearly not Atlantis, which was an ancient myth already in the time of Plato. Still, the overtones of a land doomed to eventually sink beneath the waves influence the story. All the more so as to the city of Wise, where much of the plot is laid, which has its own Breton myth ending with its being eventually engulfed by the waves. Throughout the series, the characters move though their lives, loves and conflicts, blithely unaware of this total doom hanging over their land, all but the wise magician Mergen who, as eventually turns out, is all too well aware of it, and has devoted his life to the effort of averting it. The name, Wald, is mentioned already in the first part as that of a mysterious being inspiring hush and fear. But only in the end of Maduk is Wald revealed to be a giant underwater being. A strange grey creature, human in general configuration, with glistening grey skin, short hairy neck, heavy head with smeared features and the filmy eyes of a dead fish. Who seeks to destroy the Elder Isles by breaking down the submarine pillars on which they rest. Mergen keeps a simulacrum of Wald tightly bound, and he also devotes much of his time and effort to guard Wald and soothe his monstrous hulk, and ward away whatever might disturb his long wet rest. To Morello, Mergen's rival, in a frenzy of blind hatred and revenge seeks to free Wald, and manages to get the monster's head and right arm free before being stopped by Shimrod, enough for Wald to cause a huge tidal wave which destroys Wise, bringing upon this city its foredoomed destruction, though in a manner quite different from that recounted in the original Breton myth. The rest of the Elder Isles are spared, for the time being. However, Wald can only be bound again, not destroyed, as he is under the protection of certain Elder Gods, and thus the Isles' doom is only put off. Commentator David Williams, remarking on a sense of loss, evident in much of Jack Vance's writings, notes that Vance exercised this sense of loss in high ironic form in the lioness sequence, all the adventures, all the triumphs and tragedies are futile in an ultimate sense, because the reader knows that, regardless of Mergen's striving, the Elder Isles are doomed to sink into the Atlantic Ocean. All the loves and hates, all the magic will be lost, to be recalled only faintly in myth. 
There is no clear indication of how long it would be after the last book's happy end. Aelas is still a vigorous young king, and by the prophecy which figures so large in the plot he would clearly live out his reign, and his son Dhrun would become king in turn, presumably with Maduk as his queen. It is also mentioned that in later times, fishermen sailing over drowned wise sometimes glimpsed the wonderful structures of marble, where nothing moved but schools of fish." But there is no clear indication of how many generations of fishermen would have this experience before Wald finally broke loose and the whole land shared E's fate. Topic. Awards. Lioness, Maduk received the World Fantasy Award for Best Novel in 1990, 